Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to give this short talk. So I'm going to give a talk about uh, a bit similar to Joe's yesterday, but looking into another P-type ATPs that's a bit atypical. So just quickly, we went over this yesterday, but there are three, three groups of uh, membrane transporters that are named the flipases, flopases, and scramblases. And the names really suggest what they do. So the scramblases are bidirectional and scramble uh, the lipids between the, the leaflets and have a very broad specificity. The flopases and the flipases are ATP dependent, where the flopases translocate towards the exocytosolic leaflets, whereas the flipases transport towards the cytosolic leaflet. They both have high substrate specificity, and the flipases are mainly P4 ATPases, which is what I'm going to focus on today. So, yeah, the P4 ATPases is a P type ATPase subfamily. And as Joe showed you yesterday with the beautiful structures, it mostly functions as this heterodimer with a P4 ATPase and a CDC50 accessory subunit that together make the lipid flipase. They have very high substrate specificity and they are very often auto inhibited, which makes them a bit challenging to both purify and study. We have 14 mammalian P4 ATPases and five in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is the organism I'm working in primarily. So I said that most of them function with a CDC50 subunit, but some don't. And these are the ones I'm focusing on. So I work mainly with the yeast NEO1, which should look something like this. Uh, it has no interaction with CDC50 or any other identified subunit. And in general, the CDC50 independent subgroup, they're linked to flipase activity, but it hasn't been demonstrated clearly yet. So they are a bit of a mystery so far. Specifically for NIL1, it's essential uh, in its host organism, which is why knockout studies are a bit tricky. So we can't really find out anything that way. They are located in the Golgi network and the early endosomes, and they have been linked extensively to this endosomal remodeling complex with MON2, AL1, and DOP1, to name a few. And we have some indirect published evidence of PH, PE translocation, but nothing clear yet, whether this is because it has another function or because we have testing the different, uh, the wrong substrate, so we have some kind of auto inhibition. We re don't know yet, but we are working on it. So uh, after all the talks yesterday, I looked back into my very, very early purification trials, also after hearing how popular the his tag still is, just to show that this is not necessarily, uh, cannot necessarily work for all projects. So when I started around five years ago on this project, we had a his tag cleavable by thrombin. But as you can see over here, I had no specific defined band, but more like a smear. After switching out the Protease, it turned out that thrombin was very trigger happy with near one, likely also because it was very unstable stable at that point. But even when switching the protease out, we could never really get rid of this heat shock protein, an endogenous yeast protein that kept co-purifying for no physiological relevant reason that we can identify at least. So instead, now five years later, I think, we switched to the expression strategy that Joe also mentioned yesterday. So we have near one with the biotin acceptor domain that can be cleaved by TEF in this PYED P60 vector that we got from our collaborator Guillaume Lenoir at Paris Eclé. So we express in uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae delta PEP4 cells in rich media and can do a double induction. Afterwards, we harvest the cells and we open them in this bead beater, which I normally described as a glorified blender, which is essentially what it is, by just blending the cells with a lot of beads in cycles to not overheat the protein too much. Afterwards, we isolate uh, the target membranes, which are what we call the P3 membranes, since the protein is mainly in the early endosomes and Golgi. As for the purification, this has been through a lot of iterations, uh, trying to get a stable protein, but basically we solubilize in a large excess of DDM and we bind it to the streptavidin beads by the bad tag. 
Afterwards, we do a very neat detergent exchange with the large volumes, column volume washes. And we also do a 500 millimolar sodium chloride wash to get rid of any of the few contaminants there are of endogenously biotinylated proteins. Due to the specificity of the bad tech, we have to cleave it off the beads. So we do that overnight with TEF. And just to show you, this is an expensive approach for sure, but we also get after the cleavage, the eluded protein is basically just my protein and TEF. So it's super pure, something that we're never able to accomplish with the HIST tag. Then we concentrated a lot, and I'll get back to why this is interesting. And we injected on a standard Superdex 200, and I manually collect uh, the peaks for cryo EM collection. And as you can see in this slightly overloaded gel, the protein is super pure after size exclusion. And when screening grids, it also looks very nice. We can see some helical indications. And at this point, we get about a quarter to half a milligrams per liter of culture which is a lot uh, compared to what we started out with. So we're really happy about this and where the protein has gone. So this chromatogram is actually from something I did very recently. It's the second run and I'll show you what the first run looked like. So this is my first run, very recent. And it caused me to look into element G a bit because it's not as easy to work with or as you would think because the aggregation number, so the number of detergent molecules in the micelle actually changes dramatically based on the LMNG concentration. This was all published in a very nice article by Christine Ebel's group a few years ago. So just as an example, so I, pure, I concentrate my protein 20 fold prior to SEC. So that means I have 10 CMC LMNG present in my illusion buffer. So I go from having 0 0.1 millimolar to two millimolar. So that means I go from having an aggregation number of 63, where I have 1.2 micelles per protein to actually only having half a micelle per protein with an aggregation number of 160. So this pattern, I've seen it many times. And the first one here is a dimer and the second one is my monomer. But based on the aggregation number of element G and the available micelles, it's, I mean, it makes total sense that the protein chose or made these dimers. But as an experiment, I concentrated the double peak and I incubated it with element G for a target of one and a half micelles per protein to have a small excess and incubated that 20 minutes at, oh, so, sorry, 30 minutes at 20 degrees and we ran it on SEC. And as you can see, it's a very dynamic process. So I can actually resolve most of my dimers this way. And it also shows that just, even though I thought I had plenty of LMNG present, the, this threefold increase in the aggregation number really plays a role when playing with this detergent that I'm sure we are many people using due to its very low CMC. Yes. And that was a bit of a small snapshot from what I'm doing. I would like to thank my two supervisors, Paul Nissen and Joe Lyons. And we have a small P4 ATPase group that share our successes and small frustrations. So especially thanks to a previous member, Jakob Ulstrup, who really introduced me to the project. And I took over from him and to Milena and Thibault. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you for this interesting talk, Lina. I really enjoyed like how you actually removed those double peaks in your size exclusion. Yeah, I was surprised it was that easy, but it's nice sometimes the science can be easy. Yeah, it was quite interesting. Uh, so I think we don't have any questions so far. So uh, I'll go with the next talk, which is by Julie Tucker. There was one, sorry Swati, there's one question I think for um, for Lina before we move on. I could not see it. Oh, it just came, sorry, sorry Lina, it just came to my, something happened. I'm really sorry about it. Uh, so um, uh, someone asked like, uh, can you use LMNG below its CMC? Uh, so that's a great question. Uh, yes, for size exclusion steps, we have, oh, not... So for size exclusion, we normally have around five CMCs present, mm -hmm. but 
multiple members of our group has used around three CMCs. I don't know of anyone uh, who used lower than that, but in principle, LMG should be relative, a relatively sticky detergent, so it could be possible. Uh, so we have another question. Can you provide the reference for LMNG paper? Yeah, I'll just post it in the chat in a second. Yeah. And as for Bruno asking the electrode concentration I use, I think it's 2%, but I'll have to, to check back on that. But we see a clear increase in the yield when we do the double induction instead of just a single induction. Okay, so thanks once again, Lena.